Hello, class. Welcome to A Teacher's History of the United States. Thanks for joining me again today. Did you know that the primary source of labor throughout the 17th century and even into the 18th century in the American colonies was not African slaves, but instead European indentured servants? That these indentured servants would sign a contract giving five to seven years of their life in labor to their future master in the colonies for passage to the new world. That they were provided little care and often the promises of land or new life were not kept after their indenture was over. And that Bacon's rebellion likely was one of the main impetuses for the transition from European indentured servitude to African slavery. Did you know all this? Maybe, maybe not. Get your notebooks out, because today we will learn about that and more in episode 18, Indentured Servitude and Bacon's Rebellion. All right, welcome to class. Like always, to catch everyone up, I want to briefly provide context for our lesson today. So the last few weeks, we've been discussing events in the New England area, including the Pequot War, King Philip's War, and as recently as last week with Zach and Bill, we went into much more detail about the Salem Witchcraft Trials. I hope you enjoyed that episode, and I hope you've been learning something the last few episodes about New England uh, colonial society and early American conflict in that region. The next few episodes will be without any guests, but instead, you'll just be with me. Sorry about that. We'll be talking about indentured servitude and Bacon's rebellion, and the next couple weeks we'll be moving on to African slavery in the New World. Today, though, we're going to be focusing our attention down south to that conflict I just mentioned, Bacon's Rebellion, and take a look at the unfortunate reality of indentured servitude in the American colonies. Now, don't get me wrong. Slavery was a critically important issue throughout early English colonial and American history. But one thing people often don't realize is the impact that indentured servitude had on our history. Throughout most of the 17th century, The primary source of labor in the colonies was not African slaves, but in fact was white European indentured servants. Now, look, you may have learned about our topics today, Bacon's Rebellion and American colonial indentured servitude while you were in high school or college, but if you take the time to listen to them now with a bit of a different perspective, I think you'll be able to better appreciate the magnitude of this conflict, and the role indentured servitude plays in generations of socioeconomic stratification in the colonies. When I would teach about indentured servitude and Bacon's Rebellion in my American history class, usually the curriculum called for me to just gloss over it very briefly, mentioning just a couple of key facts and then moving on to talk about Southern society or slavery, and, you know, understandably so. But I was always disheartened and a bit frustrated by the fact that I had to fly through these seemingly very important topics in early American colonial history with haste. But, of course, you can't cover everything as much as you would like to in one school year. But I can in my podcast. So that's the plan for today, indentured servitude and Bacon's Rebellion, in much more depth than you likely learned about it beforehand in high school or college. In addition, at the end of the episode today, I want you to have a clear understanding of why Bacon's Rebellion was such an important event in American colonial history and how it changed American colonial labor, really, forever. Now, as I just mentioned, slavery wasn't really the dominant labor force in the North American colonies until really the mid-1700s, 
As with many things in American colonial history, in order to fully understand not just its impact in America, but also the context for its significance, we have to take a quick peek at what was going on in Europe during this time. Now, throughout the 17th century, what we began to see across European urban landscapes, especially in large cities in England, was a rise in vagrancy. Poor workers with no land, no job, and often no money. To make matters worse, they also had little to no job prospects. Most of the land in England was taken up by the wealthy farmers, and it was used for wool, which was pretty valuable at this time. And of course, in order to produce as much wool as you can, you need to take up more and more land. The small farmers and small landholders in Europe were slowly being pushed out and losing their land, and then they would be forced into cities to look for work. And, you know, the laws of supply and demand provided that there were too many workers for too few jobs, leaving to a lot of unemployed people. Now, this life as a vagrant in England was truly terrible. And I want to note this because as we move forward, we're going to talk about just how seemingly equally or even more terrible the situation was for many servants in the American colonies. And you may be asking yourself, well, why the hell did they go there in the first place? Idiots. Well, I want you to remember that at that time, it seemed like the best option for them. We have the benefit of hindsight. Unfortunately, many of these poor souls did not. When European businessmen would see the numbers of homeless and vagrant workers in these European cities like London, they, of course, would not look for opportunity for humanitarian action, but instead would see them as opportunities for profit. Throughout the 17th century and even into the 18th century, many of these vagrants were lured to the New World. Businessmen and entrepreneurs looking for labor in the colonies would promise these men with seemingly no prospects in Europe, free passage to the New World and an opportunity to one day be guaranteed their own land and maybe even their own business in America. These were promises of circumstances that these vagrants could never really dream of in Europe, and many of them figured that the risk was one worth taking. Usually these servants we agreed to sign a contract that stipulated that they must work for approximately five to seven years in order to secure their passage to the new world. Obviously, keep in mind, these workers had no money, so they had no way to actually get themselves to America, so their trip over was basically like a loan from their new master, and in order to pay off that loan, they had to promise to work for usually five to seven years. At this time, it was especially beneficial to recruit these servants to the colonies because there was a system in place called the headright system. This headright system would guarantee every person who came over to the American colonies 50 acres of land, 50 acres per person. And that's right, all the servants who came over were also promised 50 acres of land, but this land, as yeah, you're probably afraid of, was under control of their master until they fulfilled the requirements of their indenture. This situation, of course, made it especially lucrative to lure as many workers as possible to the colonies. The voyage to the New World lasted about two to three months, with the servants being treated little better than African slaves in some circumstances. Some ships had extremely high death rates, upwards of 25% to even one-third of the servants dying on the ship. The most infamous example of this was in 1741, the Sea Flower. They were at sea for about four weeks, with over 40 of the 106 passengers dying of starvation, with six of the bodies being eaten by the survivors. A true example of 18th century cannibalism on the Atlantic. But the situation for many indentured servants on land once they arrived wasn't much better. Well, I mean, it was better than being eaten, but still pretty bad. One of the best sources for indentured servitude 
during this time comes from Gottlieb Middleberger in a document titled On the Misfortune of Indentured Servants. Gottlieb writes that, quote, when the ships had for the last time weighed their anchors near the city in old England, the real misery begins with the long voyage. For from there the ships, unless they have good wind, must often sail eight, nine, ten to twelve weeks before they reach Philadelphia. But even with the best wind, the voyage lasts seven weeks. But during the voyage, there is on board these ships terrible misery, stench, fumes, horror, vomiting, many kinds of sea sickness, fever, dysentery, headache, heat, constipation, boils, scurvy, cancer, mouth rot, and the like, all of which come from old and sharply salted food and meat, also from very bad and foul water, so that many die miserably. Add this to the want of provisions, hunger, thirst, frost, heat, dampness, anxiety, want, afflictions, and lamentations, together with other trouble, as the life abound so frightfully, especially on sick people, that they can be scraped off the body. The misery reaches the climax when a gale rages for two or three nights and days so that everyone believes that the ship will go to the bottom with all human beings on board. In such a visitation, the people cry and pray most piteously. When in such a gale, the sea rages and surges, so that the waves often rise like high mountains, one above the other, and often tumble over the ship, so that one fears to go down with the ship, when the ship is constantly tossed from side to side by the storm and waves, so that no one can either walk or sit or lie, and the closely packed people in the berths are nearby tumbled over each other, both the sick and the well, it will be readily understood that many of these people, none of whom have been prepared for hardships, suffer so terribly from them that they do not survive it. Middleberger then continues, quote, Many sigh and cry, Oh, that I were home again, and if I had to lie in my pigsty, or they say, Oh God, if only I had a piece of good bread or a good fresh drop of water. Many people whimper, sigh and cry piteously for their homes. Most of them get homesick. Many hundred people necessarily die and perish in such misery and must be cast into the sea, which drives their relatives or those who persuaded them to undertake the journey to such despair that it is almost impossible to pacify and console them. No one can have an idea of the sufferings which women in confinement have to bear with their innocent children on board these ships. Few of this class escape with their lives. Many a mother is cast into the water with her child as soon as she is dead. One day, just as we had a heavy gale, a woman in our ship, who was to give birth and could not give birth under the circumstances, was pushed through a porthole in the ship and dropped into the sea, because she was far in the rear of the ship and could not be brought forward. Children from one to seven years old rarely survived the voyage. I witnessed misery in no less than 32 children in our ship, all of whom were thrown into the sea. The parents grieve all the more since their children find no resting place in the earth, but are devoured by the monsters of the sea. Many parents must sell and trade their children away when they land, like so many head of cattle. For if their children take the debt upon themselves, the parents can leave the ship free and unrestrained. But as the parents often do not know where and to what people their children are going, it often happens that such parents and children, after leaving the ship, do not see each other again for many years, perhaps no more in all their lives. It often happens that whole families, husband, wife, and children, are separated by being sold to different purchasers, especially when they have not paid any part of their passage money. When a husband or wife has died at sea, when the ship has made more than half of her trip, the survivor must pay or serve not only for himself or herself, but also for the deceased. When both parents have died over halfway at sea, their children, especially when they are young and have nothing to pawn or pay, must stand for their own and their parents' passage and serve till they are 21 years old. When one has served his or her term, he or she is entitled to a new suit of clothes and a parting. 
And if it has been so stipulated, a man gets an addition, a horse, a woman, or a cow. As we can see, these trips to the New World were a bad omen for the servants and their poor treatment, often carried over into their everyday lives, like I mentioned, being provided little food, clothing, medical attention, or just general care. The presence of indentured servants in the American colonies helped to solidify a new social caste system in the colonies. Large landholders, who usually ended up being the masters of these indentured servants, were at the top of this class system. Below them were smaller farmers and then indentured servants and then, of course, African slaves. With the large landholders always looking to increase their wealth, thus increasing their influence, there was very little motivation for them to treat their indentured servants well and have them, you know, actually live out their five to seven year contract because then the landholder would be forced to provide his servant with the promised land, tools, and opportunity. Many of these indentured servants died prior to fulfilling the terms of their indenture. And when that happened, yep, you guessed it, the 50 acres of land went to their former master. It is hard to overestimate the impact of the potential profit in shipping servants. The forced immigration of indentured servants in the 17th and 18th century was an incredibly profitable venture by these landholding elites and these foreign businessmen. And as I mentioned, these men were all about the profit, usually treating their servants very poorly when they arrived in the New World. An indentured servant's letter home written by Richard Frethorn, describes this treatment, where he says in a letter to his parents, quote, This is to let you understand that I, your child, and in most heavy case by reason of the nature of this country, is such that it causeth much sickness as the scurvy and the bloody flux and diverse other diseases, which maketh the body poor and weak. And when we are sick, there's nothing to comfort us. For since I came out of the ship, I never ate anything but peas and loblolly, which is water gruel. As for deer or venison, I never saw any since I came to this land. There is indeed some fowl, but we're not allowed to go and get it, but must work hard, both early and late, for a mess of water gruel and a mouthful of bread and maybe beef. A mouthful of bread for a penny loaf, must serve for four men, which is most pitiful. Richard goes on and on in his letter home for pages describing his terrible treatment by his masters and his pitiful servings of food and water throughout his time there. Supporting Frethorn's complaints, William Morley from Memoirs of an Endangered Servant, 1743, states that, quote, the condition of balked servants is very hard, notwithstanding their indentures are made in England, wherein it is expressly stipulated that they shall have at their arrival all the necessities specified in those indentures to be given them by their future masters, such as clothes, meat, and drink. Yet upon complaint made to a magistrate against their master for non-performance, the master is generally heard before the servant, and it is ten to one if he does not get his licks for his pains, as I have experienced upon the like occasion to my cost. If they endeavor to escape, which is next to impossible, there being a reward for taking up any person who travels without a pass, which is extended all over the British colonies, their masters immediately issue out a reward for the apprehending them, from 30 shillings to 5 pound, if they think proper, and this generally brings them back again. Printed and written advertisements are also set up against the trees and public places in town, besides those in the newspapers. Notwithstanding these difficulties, they are perpetually running away but seldom escape, for a hot pursuit being made brings them back when a justice settles the expenses, and the servant is then inevitably obliged to serve a longer time. Even with these terrible conditions and situations, for indentured servants in America, European immigration to the New World will grow rapidly during the 17th and 18th century. With these large landholders becoming more wealthy, cities began popping up throughout the colonies and indentured servants 
were becoming increasingly marginalized and pushed to the western borders of the American colonies. Because of this, the harsh reality began to emerge for many in the colonies. It became a socioeconomic situation between the haves and the have-nots. There was distinct social stratification emerging with the rich and poor in the colonies and a very slow-growing skilled middle class. Now, of course, the lower classes did not allow this poor treatment to go unnoticed. Throughout the late 17th and 18th centuries, there were numerous rebellions, riots, and boycotts all throughout the colonies. Often the ruling elites would initially struggle to suppress the frustration, but would seemingly always win out in the end. It also didn't help that throughout the 18th century, numerous European conflicts, including most notably Queen Anne's War and King George's War, put additional financial stress on the English colonies which led to a trickle-down effect and subsequently worse conditions, pay, and financial burden on the lowest classes. Oh, and did I mention the War of Jenkins' Ear? The nine-year war fought over Robert Jenkins' ear? Yeah, that happened. We'll cover that in more detail in a future episode, though. With all of this, Things became so bad for many poor white indentured servants that most of the ruling classes in the colonies, get this, were actually afraid of these white servants joining forces with African slaves against them. So, who was benefiting off of the poor treatment of many of these white servants? Well, a handful of wealthy families, actually. So now we're going to turn our focus to these wealthy families and their indentured servants in Virginia, the wealthy family members often making up the House of Burgesses. The reason we're turning our attention to Virginia is to begin discussing Bacon's Rebellion, which took place in Jamestown. As I'm sure you can imagine, the more profitable land during this time was the land along the coast, with accessible waterways and valuable opportunities for trade. Because of this, When new immigrants would come to the new world, or when indentured servants would actually live out and work out their indenture, they were provided land along the western border, in between the wealthier landowners and businessmen, and the Native Americans. Now, you guys know about the history of Jamestown, or at least I hope you do. If not, check out episode 5 and 6. As we talked about earlier, Jamestown began to take off as a colony after John Rolfe spearheaded the proliferation of tobacco in this region. Tobacco was a seriously labor-intensive crop, which is one of the reasons why these landowners needed so many laborers, and cheap laborers at that. In addition to being a labor-intensive crop, tobacco also wears out the soil after a couple growing seasons. Therefore, there is a constant search for new land and fresh soil, to continue to grow the crop at a rapid pace. This is going to push English settlers further west at a more rapid pace than you might expect, and in turn, pushing the poor immigrants and former servants even further west into areas controlled by the natives. As I'm sure you can imagine, this will lead to inevitable conflicts with the Native Americans and force the ruling elite in these areas to try to balance their greed and ambition with regard to land acquisition and, and the necessity to limit Native American conflicts. This precarious balance saw its most legitimate threat in 1676 with the conflict Bacon's Rebellion, which we'll get back to in just a minute. Hey, everyone. I just want to say thanks again for checking in. We are three months into the podcast, and I'm really enjoying it, and I hope you are learning a lot along with me. I just wanted to remind you, if you want to reach out, always feel free to reach out to me via email, chris at a teacher's history.com, on Twitter at a teacher's hist, and on Facebook at a teacher's history podcast. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast so far, and if you're learning something, please, please leave a rating and review on iTunes and let me know on social media. So that way I can thank you for it. Anyway, Let's get back to Bacon's Rebellion. So the settlement patterns of those in Jamestown were laid out, as I just mentioned, with the wealthier large landholders owning the valuable coastal land and the poor white settlers being pushed further and further west, eventually coming into conflict with the natives. 
The Fedlers no doubt felt as though they were being used as a buffer for the wealthy aristocrats against the Native Americans because, well, <clears throat> they were. This development led to increasing frustration by the Western frontiersmen and fear that continuing Native attacks would not only threaten their lives but also their property. In a seemingly justified demand, the Western farmers requested protection from the government of Jamestown for their land and their families. This is where the ruling class of Jamestown, led by William Barclay, who spells his name Berkeley, just to be super confusing, found himself in quite the dilemma. Barclay and others in the coastal area of Virginia and the House of Burgesses did not want to anger the Native American tribes in the West. Not only was tobacco a profitable business in Virginia, but keep in mind, so was the fur trade. Wanting to keep benevolent relationships with the Native Americans in order to increase profit from the trade, Barclay and others were hesitant to open conflict. Knowing that a sustained conflict against the Native Americans would jeopardize the long-term sustainability of the fur trade in that region, the government of Jamestown supported the Western settlers very little. Enter Nathaniel Bacon. Now, Bacon actually wasn't a former indentured servant. His family is quite wealthy. But for whatever reason, he not only sympathized, but also empathized with Western farmers against the ruling elite in Jamestown. It may have been a petty conflict or one of personal nature. No one's really sure. There's also a chance that he and his supporters got involved in this conflict because they were left out of the loop in Jamestown. But no one's really sure. And if they are, they certainly haven't told me. But the farmers liked that they had bacon, and he became the face of their movement. Bacon was in his mid-30s, he was tall, slender, had dark hair, and was a powerful figure. Bacon's rebellion began with stolen cattle. That's right, stolen cattle. What started as a small conflict over this stolen cattle blew up into a much too large one, with many Western settlers embracing armed conflict with the local Native Americans. Bacon and his men attacked native tribes to the south, which for a short period of time seemed like the leverage that they needed. The House of Burgesses called a special session, re-implemented their voting rights, which they previously taken away because, well, you know, of course they did, and even tried to limit the power of Governor William Barclay. When Bacon demanded a commission to lead the militia against the Native Americans, Barclay reportedly responded by, quote, bearing his breast to Bacon basically exposing his chest and daring Bacon to shoot. When Bacon realized Barclay wasn't backing down, he then took aim at the other members of the House of Burgesses and was able to get his commission. But after being rebuffed by officially being supported by the government of Jamestown, Bacon was furious and issued the, quote, Declaration to the People, otherwise known as Bacon's Manifesto, which I read, so you don't have to. In it, he outlines his complaints against the ruling class in Jamestown, many of them being well known to most people at the time. Taxes were too high, the ruling elite were corrupted by the beaver trade, and the fact that they were refusing to help adequately defend the farmers in the conflicts against the natives. After a few months of conflict, Bacon and his forces, numbering upwards of 500 men, moved on Jamestown, burning the colonial capital to the ground, on September 19, 1676, with William Barclay retreating during the raid. But the glory for Nathaniel Bacon doesn't last very long, because just in the next month, October of 1676, Nathaniel Bacon dies of dysentery. And if you know about dysentery, which is basically uncontrollable diarrhea, that is a really crappy way to die. No pun intended. I actually just saw that. That was pretty good. Barclay eventually takes back power in 1677 and hangs 23 of the rebels and takes back all the land. In the end, what seems like a pretty minor conflict in the grand scheme of American history 
had a couple long-lasting and impactful effects. And these are important. I want you to really listen closely here because this outlines why Bacon's Rebellion was so important. The wealthy in Virginia recognized that it was actually better to go to war with the Native Americans than to continue to be in conflict with the poor whites. If you're able to have a better relationship with these poor white settlers, you're, of course, able to avoid class conflict, and you can turn them against the Native Americans. In addition, if you're on peaceful terms with these Western farmers, they can continue to remain a buffer between the land-holding commercial elite and the Native Americans. This way, the poor will be doing the fighting. And as French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre said, it's the rich that wage war, it's the poor who die. And the rich like to keep it this way. Additionally, the wealthy were genuinely worried that black slaves and white servants would one day fight together in an uprising. Bacon's rebellion reminded them that keeping the white settlers a bit happier would prevent this from happening. When reflecting on the idea of indentured servitude after Bacon's rebellion and throughout the early 18th century, some in the colonies began to realize that the whole system just wasn't going to work. See, there was no land or labor for the free whites that were surviving their indentured, and damn it, some of them were actually surviving it. It wasn't going to work in perpetuity because you're dealing with finite resources. With that, the headright system was abolished, and wealthy farmers in the colonies were not going to continue to rely on European servants, but instead turn their attention towards African prisoners that they can use as slaves. Now, look, this wasn't an overnight transition. It's not like November 1676, all of a sudden there are no indentured servants and only African slaves do the labor. This took generations to fully take effect. But it is undeniable that Bacon's Rebellion played a critical role in transitioning the labor force of the Americans away from European indentured servants and towards African slaves, a monumental shift in the socioeconomic fabric of the European colonies. European servants will continue to come over to the New World throughout the 18th century, but with repeated letters home, like the ones I read to you, and word of mouth spreading throughout Europe, you can imagine life as an indentured servant is now realized to be little better or even worse than that of a European vagrant. And because of this, the numbers of indentured servants coming over from Europe began to continuously dwindle. Lastly, because of limited opportunities for upward mobility, former servants, many of them becoming tenant farmers on the land that they worked as a servant, had a difficult time getting out of the cycle of poverty and political powerlessness that will continue to reinforce and further cement the social stratification that indentured servitude created in the first place. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. As I mentioned, next week, we will stay down south and we'll continue to talk about oppression in the south. This time, not white European indentured servants, but we'll begin discussing the horrible and incredibly embarrassing role of African slavery in the founding of our nation. See you then. <laughs>